thank you for joining us, everyone. I'm, I know it's been a long day if you've been in all the sessions, um, but uh, my name is Morgan Pila and, and Leisha Ostrow is joined or is here with me. Uh, so I'll let her get started as she's going to kick us off. Uh, hey, everybody, the conversation we were just having beforehand, I think is, I don't know, the, the, compared to that conversation, the data will be simple. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about a study that we just wrapped up in September. Um, it was a three year study of recently certified peer specialists across the country. Um, next slide. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was supposed to introduce myself. Sorry. I'm Leisha Ostro. Um, I'm the CEO of Live and Learn. We are uh, based in Morro Bay, but um, we do work all across the country. And um, I believe that Live and Learn is the only formal peer-run research organization in the United States. So we're proud to still be here. And, uh, yeah, let's talk about our research and Morgan will introduce herself. Yeah, so my name is, is Morgan Pilot, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I am the program manager for Live and Learn. So I kind of oversee all of our projects. The CPS project was was kind of it felt like my baby because I saw it from you know start to finish. Um, and so, and then in addition to my role at Live and Learn, I have past experience working as a peer counselor. So I have the direct experience of being in the role. Um, of course, that was before certification. Uh, so I did not. I'm not certified in the state of California. Um, so for today's presentation, uh, our main goal is to talk about this research that we've done. So we're going to describe the um, Certified Peer Specialist Career Outcome Study. We acknowledge that uh, there are many acronyms for peer support workers. Uh, we are going to use CPS throughout this presentation, um, just because that is the definition that we used in our grants and all those things. Um, and the whole study is called uh, the Career Outcome Study, so CPS COS. Um, then we're going to go into sharing some of the analysis, analyses from baseline data, which this is back in 2020. And then we're going to wrap up by um, suggesting future research and policy change based on the findings that we we've, were presenting. Um, so this project would not be possible. So we just without fun, our funders and, and partners and other um, advisors that joined us. Um, so this project was funded in part by the grant number on the screen by Nidler, who is with or under the U.S. Administration for Community Living Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. Um, and then our partners, we uh, were partnered with Temple University Center on Community Living and Participation for People with Serious, I think it's Mental Illness, I cannot see underneath my, let me hide my stuff here. Um, Anyway, and then the University of Illinois uh, Chicago Center on Mental Health. Lisa, can you help me? We're I not seeing that slide, Morgan. Now, now we just see the oh. first slide. Hold I on. Have to go back to um. Let me reset here? here. Technical difficulties. You always gotta love it starting with that. Okay. Perfect. See that slide. Now I'm gonna hide my administrative stuff. Why does this keep popping up? Are you seeing it, Nesco? Okay. Um, either way, these are our partners. We um, pro The project wouldn't be possible without them. We were also joined by um, advisors that were um, worked in peer support, that trained peer supporters, um, that were independent peer supporters. Um, we're getting some feedback. So if, it, if you're not muted, can I just ask that you please mute yourself or that, John, you can take care of that, hopefully. Um, so yes, this is, this is the background. And I'll let Leisha uh, describe the project. Uh, yeah, so in 2019, we got a grant from Nidler for this three-year study. Um, this, there's a lot of studies, as I'm sure you all know, about um, the role of peer supporters and their job characteristics. Um, what was different about this study is um, that we were looking at people who were recently certified, whether or not they worked in peer support or not. Um, so we're able, as you'll see in the results that we present, to compare the people who are working in peer support to jobs that are not in peer support, since I'm sure you all have the experience of either getting certified and then doing some other work or doing other work on the side or whatever. So um, we're able to look at that. Um, you can just like keep moving the slides. I don't really, I don't know when our bullets on them. Uh, yeah, so we had three research questions. One was, um, what is their work life like after certification? And has that changed since before they got certified? Um, is their employment related to the local unemployment rate? 
um, and other contextual factors in the environment? And what is the impact of certification on peer specialist, social, emotional, and financial situation? So we're actually going to address all of those. But as Morgan said, this is just the baseline data from 2020. We had the, um, I guess, misfortune of beginning recruitment for this study. We got approved by the IRB to start data collection the day before California shut down for the pandemic. So it was a little bit chaotic. But regardless, um, people were very generous with their time and chose to participate. So we had four states participating. Oregon, Texas, um, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. Of course, at that time, we couldn't use California because we didn't have certification here. Um, so we chose them to have a range of, of participants around the country in different states. Um, the states, this is sort of interesting. So all of the states obviously have some kind of record of who's been certified. Accessing that is another story. Um, in some places like Oregon, and I think also I know Virginia and probably some others, those are databases are public, so you can look up who's certified. You can look up your own certification or whatever, just like you would if you were going to see a doctor. You can look up their license number. Um, and then in other states, uh, they have a private database that's not accessible to the public. Um, so we, there were some states that we wanted to work with where they were unwilling to share their um, roster of people who had been certified in the last year. Um, in some of those states, it was because they claimed that these people who have a professional certification are protected by HIPAA because they also have some kind of psychiatric history. Um, I mean, yeah, it, they say it's a HIPAA thing, but it's not a HIPAA thing because this is in terms of their employment. You know, like a doctor could have bipolar disorder, but their license is still in his public database. Uh, so we didn't, couldn't work with those states, obviously. Um, and we also chose them based on having a large number of people who had been certified in 2019 um, so that we would have a larger potential sample. Okay, so I'm going to go over, just give you a little bit of a background of who the sample is, just so you can kind of know as we go into our results. Um, so starting with age, this is the age distribution across the entire sample, or at least the sample that we um, ran analysis on. Um, so the age range was between 21 was our youngest and 83 was our oldest in our sample with an average of 46. It makes sense because you can kind of see the clustering on the chart. Um, and then this is our breakdown of gender. So majority female, uh, about 30% that were identified as male. And then a smaller sample, but still uh, you know, important to note that we did have uh, about just over 3% that identified as non-binary, gender queer, I'm getting mixed up in my words today, and transgender. Um, and then a few other characteristics we wanted to note were race. Um, so Race is a very complicated demographic to ask. You'd say check all that apply because most people just don't identify as one single thing. So this is just an overview of all of those options. And so um, again, majority is white uh, with about 25% identifying as black. Um, some smaller percentages in American Indian, Asian and native Hawaiian and Alaskan native. And then we had this other that just were people that didn't um, identify as any of the above. 9% um, identified as Latinx ethnicity. For education breakdown, uh, we had 15% with um, their high school diploma or GED. 39% um, that um, said they had, had attended some college, 15% with an associate's degree, 22 with a bachelor's degree, and 9% uh, that have uh, attended graduate or professional school. Um, I will note here that this is um, uh, this sample is like has higher educational attainment than what a lot of like a sample of um, people with psychiatric disabilities. And that's in part because of the fact that um, a lot of states have a requirement of education. So uh, edu or high school was required by all four states, a high school diploma or GED. I see a hand up, but we're going to ask to have, hold all questions till the end. So if you can. I just want to let you know that have the bottom part of your PowerPoint is cut off. Interesting. Oh, I can see it. Oh, where is it cut off from, Camille? Ethnicity. Okay. Oh. Do you have your um, Zoom settings down there? If there, I wonder if that's because I had to hide mine to be able to see it. Either way, I have it. It's I can't see it. Okay. I mean, I can see just the top part of it, but it's it. not that important. I'm just letting you know. Thank you for letting me know. It's good to know. We'll keep that in mind for anything that's lower down below. Um, that being said, the, I think these are going to be shareable afterwards. Um, and you can also email us. Our email will be, or my email will be at the end if you want the slides directly. 
but thank you for letting us know. Okay, um, so now that we know who the sample is, I'm going to hand it back to Laisha so she uh, can talk about the tr our first paper. Yeah, can you put something on the slide so I know what it's going to yeah. um, Okay, so for this analysis, we had 591 participants um, who had been certified. 55 of those said they were working in peer support. Uh, 21 were working in another job in another field. Um, that could be like anything, right? They could be working in education or, um, you know, in retail or having their own business or something. And then 24% were not working, they were unemployed. Um, so we wanted to understand um, what what is associated with these different groups, how people, you know, the people who were employed, um, what are their characteristics versus people who are working, people employed in peer support versus other jobs and not working. Um, so obviously we always look at demographic characteristics. Um, we looked at their what their self-reported mental health service use and um, diagnosis, uh, their work history, um, and then whether they were located in a rural or urban area. So um, the what the um, boxes that are coming up on the screen are the factors that are associated with not being employed, so being unemployed. So people who were on Social Security benefits, either SSI or SSDI, were more likely to be unemployed. Um, people who were veterans were more likely to be unemployed. Um, uh, people who you were more likely to use mental health services were less likely to be employed. And then people, this is sort of interesting, I'm interested in people's take on this. Um, People who said that they do not disclose um, their psychiatric history at work were more likely to be unemployed. Um, so for people that were working in peer support, they were more likely to disclose to their colleagues, obviously, I mean, just having a job title um, is part of that disclosure. Uh, they had a they lived in an area where there was a lower unemployment rate so they're sort of benefiting from that overall rate um people who specifically reported having a depression um diagnosis were more likely to be in peer support um and another one okay so um so then we looked at the quality of these peer support jobs they have self-reported characteristics of the jobs So um, in terms of job quality and tenure, so tenure refers to how long they've been in a job. Um, uh, we looked at the, whether there's full-time versus part-time, whether they received benefits like paid time off and health insurance or didn't have any benefits. The only real, this is the difference. So the, the blue bars are peer support jobs and the orange bars are other types of jobs. Um, so the only significant difference between these, I mean, you can see these little differences, but in terms of statistical significance, um, there was a significant difference for peer support jobs being more likely to have paid time off for people in those jobs than other type of jobs. And then job satisfaction. Um, so the peer support jobs did have higher rates of job satisfaction compared to jobs outside of peer support. Um, I think that's probably sort of unsurprising, especially since people had gone through the trouble to get certified. Uh, you would hope that they would have a higher satisfaction with that job. Um, and this is a quote from a participant. Um, I consider myself very fortunate. This is a dream job. Hands-on work with my clients. Nothing beats it. We, of course, got a lot of comments that were not so positive, but um, since we're talking about satisfaction here, we're showing those. Someone else said, I love my job. I love my people. I'm very busy all the time, but it's kind of like my getaway from my life. This has always been my passion to come in and stand alongside someone. It allowed me, a person thriving in recovery but lacking in formal education, to have a job that wasn't in a restaurant while still being of service. Um, so you know the we we are not we didn't present it in this slide or these slides, but we did ask about motivation for um pursuing the certification, and and there were a lot of people that had said. Um, you know, they wanted it because they wanted to have a letter behind their names or get a better job or be able to, you know, kind of overstep this like need to have a uh, higher education, like a master's or something to be able to work with people. Um, so the next analysis that we're going to talk about is on burnout. Um, and all of these are, are individual papers that have either been published and accepted or are in the works of, of being so. 
Um, and so this, the paper that talked about burnout, the reason why we were really interested in this is because burnout is not widely explored among certified peer specialists. Um, you know, it's become kind of a buzzword for um, recently and especially after the pandemic and everything. And we look, it's been looked at for a lot of mental health or um, physical health and mental health careers, but not a uh, certified peer specialist. Um, so the definition uh, by the World Health Organization is feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, feelings of cynicism related to one's job and reduced professional efficacy stemming from chronic workplace stress. Um, so really what this means is there's these three characteristics that we're gonna be talking about or that are important to know. Um, and the first two are exhaustion and cynicism, which are defined as being emotionally overextended and exhausted by work and unfeeling and impersonal responses towards uh, recipients of one's services. And so when these two things are high, those are more likely to uh, be within people that are feeling more burnt out. And then the third one is professional efficacy, which is the feelings of competence and stress in one's work. And so um, in someone that has, is experiencing burnout or high burnout, uh, this would be low. And so if the reverse were true, if it was high professional efficacy and low um, exhaustion cynicism, that person would be less burnt out. Um, so the predictors of burnout, we were obviously interested in knowing what is contributing to this among our sample. And so the individual characteristics that uh, were predictors were for lower burnout were race other than white and Latinx um, ethnicity, older age and general uh, higher general self-efficacy. So if these things were present or these characteristics were present for the individual, they were more likely to have lower burnout. Um, for higher burnout, uh, we noticed that um, depressive disorder compared to other diagnoses uh, kind of makes sense with the exhaustion that is experienced in depression, uh, leading to higher burnout, longer time on a job and number of jobs held in the past five years. So if they had held more jobs, they were more likely to be burnt out. Um, but instead of just looking at individual characteristics, there's always there's also these areas of work life that we wanted to look at. Um, because there is probably aspects that can be changed about um, the organization or the employer uh, and the, the work-life balance and all that good stuff. So the environmental characteristics that were predictors, we found that the ones that contributed to lower burnout were better workload, fairness, reward, and community within your um, workplace, and then the number of negative work experiences. Um, I believe our negative of work experiences was Kellogg's um, was from the Kellogg survey. Am I saying that right? The um, disability. Kessler. Ke oh, Kessler. Yeah, we took a scale from another survey that they do of um, uh, people with disabilities in general. Um, although people with psychiatric disabilities overall have more negative work experiences than other groups, but there are things like, um, like you know, the way that your supervisor treats you or your coworkers. Um, you know, difficulty getting the training that you need or getting a job, things like that. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, the number of negative work experiences, if they were, they had less, they had lower burnout. Um, so again, we wanna look at uh, what about burnout among peer specialist jobs versus other jobs. And so this is the distribution. Um, again, this blue teal color is for peer support jobs. And this orange is for all other jobs that were not peer support jobs. Um, and so we do see that these are lower. So exhaustion and cynicism are lower and professional so efficacy is higher, which is lower burnout. Um, and so that was one of our findings is that uh, peer support jobs, people in peer support, peer support jobs were experiencing lower burnout. Um, so the predictors of lower burnout among PS jobs were um, again, that older age, that uh, areas of work life of community, greater reward, fairness, and greater values. Um, so a lot less, a lot less things that are related to the person as an individual and a lot more that are related to that work life, uh, characteristics. So predictors that were, uh, related to higher burnout among these, this, this group were, um, longer tenure in peer support jobs. So again, like Leisha had mentioned, 10 years is how long you've been at the job. And so the longer that you're in a peer specialist job, um, the more likely you are to experience burnout. And just as a reminder, I know we've said this a few times, but this is baseline data. And so while we see that uh, people in peer support jobs have lower burnout, we are curious to run this analysis again with our, our final data set and see, has that increased you know, for these folks, especially that have stayed in peer support jobs? Um, so that's something we're looking forward to learning and figuring out. Um, and then just one of our, you know, one of our findings were that, um, 
peer support workers who were experiencing higher burnout were more likely to be uh, looking for um, a new job, which that makes sense. And then, uh, yeah, onto the hot topic of wages and financial well being. Um, so, as everybody I'm sure knows, peer support jobs um, do not pay that well. So, we, again, we have this comparison group of people, similar sorts of people who are not working in peer support and found that. Um, that the peer support jobs didn't pay significantly better than the non-peer support jobs. So if you're interested in wages, it's sort of um, a wash. Uh, and so a lot of these people were receiving substandard wages no matter what field they were in compared to national averages. Uh, so here is a graph of the average hourly wages. The lower, so the first category is from our, our data. Um, and then the other ones are from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and then the bottom bar of $27.07, that's just the average nationwide of all jobs. So that includes tech people and I don't know, I don't know what the lowest paying job is, but probably peer support given that it's fifteen ninety three. Um, so uh, when we were code, we had to sort of manually code all of the jobs. It's a ton of work. Um, so we um, coded them into the category of community health workers, which have notable differences to peer support, but are sort of the most similar category that exists in the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. I'm sure you all know that there is no specific job category um, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics for peer support, and that's something that I think people have been advocating for on a national level for a lot of reasons. Um, and one of them, from my perspective as a researcher stakeholder, would be that it would make research a lot easier if we didn't have to manually code jobs. Um, and I mean, there's all kinds of data that we would be able to get from this as a community to use in advocacy. Um, I think also notably, the category below peer support, social and human service assistance, that's the lowest paying job in this category of human service workers. And they still make three dollars more an hour on average than peer support workers so we're like the lowest of the low um here's a quote from a participant the magic figure of 15 dollars per hour being a living wage is only true if that's net income and then it's a struggle but there are rewards beyond income in this field um so some other findings from this analysis um, people who were um, SSDI or SSI beneficiaries um, were less likely to be working full time. It's probably fairly intuitive. Um, people living in a small town or rural community um, had lower pay on average, including for peer support jobs. Um, so veterans, though, had significantly higher pay rates. Part of that is that the VA pays is uh, the peer specialist working for the VA or on the VA pay scale, which um, is often higher than other peer support jobs. I think there's a one other. Oh yeah. Um, people who had more education also had higher pay rates in regards to the job category, which is something you see everywhere. Um, so we used a measure called um, financial well-being, which was developed by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, they define this as a state where a person can fully meet current and ongoing financial obligations, can feel secure in their financial future, and is able to make choices that allow them to enjoy life. So this scale is just um, like a self-report of your perceptions. It's not um, doesn't take into account in that scale your wages. Um, so our uh, partic the participants in this study had an average score of 52. Um, which is significantly below the median of 54, um, which the CFPB collected from a nationally representative sample. And interestingly, that nationally representative sample it includes people who are retired, people who are disabled. So it's taking all that into account. So we, peer support specialists still had a lower financial well-being. And 52 is scored as having a moderate likelihood of experiencing financial hardship. Um, so we did find some characteristics that were related to having higher financial well-being. So having a higher hourly wage, um, being a veteran, uh, being older, um, people who identify as Latinx, and people who um, reported better physical health had higher financial well-being. Um, and then the last analysis that we're going to talk about today uh, is a paper that we're hoping that gets you know approved soon, uh, so that we can, we can share it more widely. Um, but is looking at the mental health professional shortage area 
Um, and I know this was a topic of, of an earlier presentation, so, and I attended it, so I'll kind of tie in some of their points as well. Um, so um, MH, mental health professional shortage areas, uh, are designated based on the ratio of mental health providers to residents in uh, specific counties. This can include um, psychiatrists, psychologists, people who have you know, their family marriage therapy license and all those things. Um, but I don't think it includes uh, certified peer specialists. Not yet, um, but yeah. Um, but it was interesting because the presentation I attended earlier today who, that discussed this, they had mentioned that they looked at the age and um, that a lot of these providers are, or not a lot, but I think it was like 40% are in their 60s. And so they're gonna be aging out of the field. And so, um, you know, they're gonna be leaving behind more shortages. And so the Health Resources and Service Administration uh, has kind of identified these shortage areas and they've identified 5,000 or yeah, 5,800, a little bit over. Um, this impacts approximately 120 to Ameri million Americans, which is 37% of the population. Um, and they've estimated that over 6,000 mental health providers are needed to fill these gaps. Um, there's a very cool tool on their website that it like, I'm pretty sure updates daily. I don't know how they do that. That's very impressive, but very cool tool. So these numbers might be a little bit off if you check it today. Um, but either way, there's a, we have a huge need for uh, mental health providers. And so hopefully you've gathered, if you don't already know, but from this conference that, um, you know, certified peer specialists or people working in peer support, they do enhance the behavioral health workforce. You know, there's a lot of positive outcomes that come from peer support and receiving peer support. Um, and now they may be able to address the service professional or provider shortage that we're seeing. So what we did was we wanted to look at the relationship between people in our st study that uh, resided in these mental health shortage areas and um, employment among uh, certified peer specialists. So what did we find? Um, so I know our earlier number was 591, but only 572 of those provided a residential zip code. That's how we pulled these numbers. Um, and of those, there were 166 unique counties that were identified. Um, 47 that were characterized in our sample as a mental health professional shortage area, um, and 14% of our participants resided in one of these. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I know that this is lower than the national average of, of who resides in them. So this could be an underrepresented sample. Um, so we looked at um, different characteristics of employment and these uh, mental health shortage area uh, residents and so uh, the first set of bars, again, were or not again, but um, the teal or blue color is um, mental health professional, someone that's residing in a mental health professional shortage area. The orange is um, people that are not. And so the first set of bars are just employment in any kind of job. Um, but really what we want to point out are these, these two sets on the side where it's um, people employed in peer support versus other jobs and those that are not employed and then people employed in peer support versus other jobs. Um, and we see that there are more residing or higher bars in these uh, mental health professional shortage areas. And so what does this mean? Um, so residential status was not a predictor of employment status in general. So residing in a mental health professional shortage area did not mean you were more likely to be working or not working, but it was associated with greater likelihood of employment in peer support. So this kind of you know supports this idea that uh, peer support specialists might be um, filling these gaps where they're where they're needed. So the conclusions from all of this, I know we just gave you a lot to think about and a lot of all over the place. Um, so our results indicate that workers um, with a CPS certificate or credential have higher employment rates compared to um, all adults with psychiatric disabilities. Um, some of the positive aspects that we noticed and found in our research of peer support jobs specifically, um, they have higher job tenure and are more likely to offer employee benefits, especially that paid time off that we talked about. Um, they had higher job satisfaction overall, lower burnout. Again, we're pending the uh, longitudinal study, but they were lower burnout uh, at the beginning. Um, and they may be able to help leverage this workforce gaps uh, and you know bridge the impact of the shortage. 
Um, so our next steps are to do this longitudinal analysis. So take, you know, we have the three different survey waves um, and take all of the results that we're talking about now and applying them across all those waves, including, you know, three years from when they first joined the study. Um, and so we definitely encourage you that if you have any thoughts or things that you're curious about, I mean, I know you don't know what we collected at all, but based on what we're talking about, if there's things that you are curious about or are like, this would be a good idea to look at it, feel free to share them in the comments or when we get to questions, um, because we can definitely look at those and explore those different avenues. Um, yeah, so in terms of our what our recommendations would be based on the work that we've done so far, again, to create a job category for um, peer support or peer specialists at the federal level, wage equity with other healthcare workers, I mean, at least getting to that, you know, $18, if not more. Um, uh, based on the results of our financial well-being analysis, um, you know, enhancing physical wellness, social capital factors, and financial literacy can help contribute to better financial well-being. Um, it's really important, I think, and I think this is a hot topic a lot of the time um, everywhere, but especially in peer support, um, you know, improving organizations um, to improve these characteristics that lead to lower burnout or prevent burnout and turnover. So looking at workload demands for peer specialists, being treated with fairness and respect, um, getting rewards consistent with your expectations, that includes wages, um, and having a sense of community in the workplace. Um, in terms of the shortages, um, some of the ideas that we had um, for getting those peer specialists into those areas that have a shortage, um, providing remote access to online training and education programs for people who are living in rural areas, providing financial incentives for relocating to rural and underserved areas after certification. So I know for other healthcare professionals, sometimes there are like, you know, loan forgiveness programs for doctors who go to rural areas, but to my knowledge, there's nothing like that for peer specialists to go into those areas. Um, and of course, continuing to generate evidence of improved outcomes from peer support services so that there's an incentive for counties and local areas to create those jobs. Um, and I, I want to say someone had asked about like other quotes and stuff in the study. I'm putting in the chat, this is on the next slide too, but we have a project website um, where we the, you just go to the homepage and there's a lot of data there, a lot of the data that we presented and we're like continuously updating that um, whenever we have results. So you don't have to pour through dry academic papers that frankly, when I read them, I'm like, what is what I'm trying to say here? You can just go to the website, it'll be a lot. A lot easier that and uh i think a paper soon will be we did uh qualitative interviews as well that's where some of these quotes come from um and i think a paper is in the works or being i just signed some documents today for it to be published so um so that'll be in the works too and again that like Leisha said they'll, it'll be added to our project website um before we get to that though uh this is just a great quote from uh one of the one of our participants um so they say these mills, these mills that are turning out uh, peer support specialists, and then you have an industry that's not hiring, and now it's becoming one more mechanism for a third party to come in and start making uh, a profit. Um, and so we've definitely heard, you know, we, we presented a lot of positive findings uh, and positive aspects of the peer support work, but we hear all the time that, you know, peer specialists either can't find a job or um, they get a job and they're expected to do things that are not, that go against their peer nature, and um, so much, much more context in the quotes, I will say. Um, and this is that website that Leisha was talking about. So um, as Leisha mentioned, we will be updating it. Uh, all of the, uh, you can email us if you, if you want the um, papers that we went over, but all of these results and stuff will be there as well. Um, and then you can go to our main website to learn more about our other work and follow us on all the medias. And yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw there's a question in the chat from um, Bethel. Um, hope I'm saying that right. Um, do you have data on peer support specialists, entrepreneurs, business owners offering privatized support? Yes, we do. We actually have, I think, 10% of the sample was self reported being self employed at um, in this timeline that we're talking about. Um, and they, um, a lot of them were working in sort of wellness peer businesses. Um, we haven't gotten to any analysis on that yet, but that's one of my main areas of interest is entrepreneurship by 
um, people with lived experience. So we have another project that sort of addresses that. Someone else put in here the Hey Peers website. So Hey Peers, um, they're one of our project partners. Um, they're based out of Pasadena. And uh, you can go on there and sort of hang your shingle to provide peer support as a, as a contractor to individuals or through organizations. Um, but I think that's a huge area. We just submitted a grant a couple of months ago to do a study on what are the requirements in each state for peer specialists to be self-employed and have their own private practice. Um, so here's hoping that that gets funded because I think that would be a huge help in helping individuals in each of the states figure out kind of where the boundaries are for having a private practice. And, you know, aside from sort of the Medicaid billing and the licensing, you know, what are some of the workarounds maybe for that? And how do you run a business like that and still make a living for yourself? Yeah. Um, I see a comment like early on when we first got started about um, other characteristics such as type of lived experience. For our study, we were very specific uh, Lee recruiting people that had mental health lived experience, although some people had both, you know, live, uh, mental health and um, uh, substance use. But we did not have any family peer supporters in our study. Um, and it really breaks down to the different states and their requirements. But our goal was was mental health peer supporters. Yeah, we when we did um, recruitment, so we just if the state had certified someone, then they were considered eligible for the study. So we didn't get into like, you're eligible for this based on your diagnosis or your specific, I mean, we did ask about those things in the survey so we can use an analysis, but we didn't make a determination as to whether someone had lived experience or not. Exactly. And I'm sure as you may know, the folks in this group, there's a wide definition across states. I've, I've done presentations where I've gone like, state by state and said, you know, these are the differences. And some some have a really loose definition and some are like, no, you need to be like two years in recovery, whatever that means, because I think recovery is a very um, not straight process. <laughs> yeah, and there's a, um, we worked on this with the Copeland Center, the folks who do RAF, I'll put this in the uh, chat, but um, they have a database of all the different requirements in different states for becoming certified. So we're sort of like the project I was talking about, looking at um, private practice peer support. We're hoping to make a database just like this, but specific to working for yourself. Any other questions? I know some people have been using the hand raising method in other uh, other presentations. You can either send them in the chat or um, or raise your hand. Will you be providing your um, email addresses? Oh, or sure, I can. Put mine in the chat. Thank you. And Laisha? We don't give Laisha's out. <laughs> no. oh, sure, sure. It's freely available on the internet. My email address, that's what you want. I can put it in there, Laisha. I got it. Okay. Thank you, guys. see a comment about in Wisconsin not needing to be a peer to provide peer support as an entrepreneur, only Medicaid reimbursement requires certification. Um, yeah, I mean, the issues beyond that. Yeah, <laughs> the issue is beyond that. But um, yeah, I mean, I know some states where people work in peer, like we asked in our study, and it gets very, um, we have a lot of information on job data. I mean, we had like 800 jobs from baseline. So imagine going through and like Leisha said, coding all of those. Um, but we had asked if they required certification or um, training or neither. And so there were quite a few peer support jobs that didn't even require having it. Um, and we had some people that, you know, had to get it to get a job. So it just depends on the state. Any other questions? Feel free to just chime in. Like if you, I know for me personally, it's always taken me a really long time to figure out the hand raising feature in Zoom for whatever. I have, an, I have another question. This is Joy De La Luz. Thanks everyone. Oh my goodness. Your presentation is really dynamic and very informative. It's answered a lot of my questions that were pre-verbal. So thank you for that. I um, was curious about the downsides of, the downside experiences of those people who graduated 
and are not certified, but then went into the field and weren't quite that satisfied. You talked about other people who were uh, really happy and they had found their dream jobs, but I, I'd like to know the other end of the spectrum as well. Um, yeah, so I said, in terms of like specific quotes, um, you know, you can look on our website for some of those and the paper that Morgan mentioned that's coming out is a qualitative study where we interviewed people um, and, um, you know, got in a conversation rather than survey data. I mean, I think the thing overall, mm. right, is that this is all based on statistics is based on averages. So when we say, mm -hmm. you know, um, peer specialists had lower burnout than um, people in other jobs, you know, there's a range in there and we're, we're operating under average. So some of those people in peer support had negative experiences and some of them had much more positive experiences and the same with the people um, in other jobs. Um, I think for digging into what those negative experiences are, that the quality of data is really useful for that. And we'll put that paper on our website when we have it published. Yeah. As I say, the other thing is too, is um, I think in our last survey, we asked if people like had stayed in peer support or not and why. Um, so as we get into, you know, that going through that data analysis, I'm sure we can try to find some kind of, to be able to quantify that and say, this is how many people were happy they did it. And this is how many people were not happy they did it. And then of course the, the context around that of why. Um, yeah, you you always design a survey thinking you're going to use all the data right away. And you're like, I have all this stuff that I don't know what to do with. <laughs> um, we'll get there, though. Yeah, someone has to comment something like, um, like, what's the hold up with the grant or whatever? You know, can't you just do it? But, you know, like it's a excuse my language, a shit ton of work to do research. <laughs> it's the data collection is the only part of it. Right. Like, yeah. you know, and I like speaking of job quality and education, or whatever, I have two hundred thousand dollars in school debt for getting a master's degree and a PhD. And we have employees wow. to support like it takes a lot of work. So it's like it seems like, oh, you just like run some analysis as a computer. Like, can't you just do that in your free time? But speaking of burnout, I personally experienced that mm. much of the time. Um, do we so, put do we yeah. put our names I, on an email list to get the quantifying um the qualitative I data? I was yeah. gonna say actually let me I'll stop screen sharing. Um I will put a great we have a newsletter that we send out and so you can tell us what you want to receive information on, like you could say peer support. And so any kind of news that we have about that, uh you that's the best. I always say that's the best way because like we can't remember who to email individually, but uh, the newsletter is always a great resource. So I'll put that in the chat. Thank you. Someone said self-care is in order when I said I was born out. And that's the, the funny thing about being self-employed, right? It's like, um, I designed my workplace, you know? So then they're like, whose fault is this? <laughs> okay, here's the link. Maybe, okay. You looking for the newsletter link? Yeah. I just, my computer wasn't letting me select at all. Um, but that link will take you to our page that you can sign up for our newsletter and receive all sorts of fun stuff. And we don't spam you. I think we're on a roll right now where we've done like one a month, but, but that's usually only because we're doing so much great stuff currently. <laughs> but once we get into like data collection, they're like maybe two times, three times a year. Yeah, we don't have time to spam you. So yeah, kind of make it high quality and less time, less number of emails. Um, I will also say on the on the conversation too of you know these are averages and so you know not all experiences are represented. Uh, unfortunately, there's a huge response bias in in this kind of survey where they see certified peer specialist career outcome study. Well, I'm not working as a cer certified peer specialist, so I'm not going to fill out your survey. Or um, you know, oh, I had a terrible experience, so I don't want to talk to you people, and that's totally fine. And like we did our best to say like no, we are peers. We want to hear from you. We you know we understand that it can be really difficult and this research is what we hope, you know, will launch those conversations of how to make improvements and stuff. So there's, you know, probably some response bias of people who had great experiences coming in, filling out our survey. Yeah, and the same, someone had pointed out earlier that the proportion of people who had a bachelor's degree was really high. And, and there's, you get like response bias for people who have more education and more likely to respond to online surveys. So one of the ongoing problems with online surveys. And say any other questions? I mean, we can stick around and chat still, but I'm all for yeah, getting more time. I, I was interrupted. I couldn't participate. Um, and I was just wondering, um, did you find out any research about um, 
uh, you know, like some kind of ratio formula of how much support they got, employment support, uh, like OT themselves. Um, like I, trans I was trying to think if we had a, a question in the survey that asked about um, like supports offered. I know when they were a peer support job, we did ask um, the type of organization and if there were other, like if there was um, the opportunity to move up or like a career ladder. Um, we got more into that in the qualitative interviews though, asking directly, you know, do you feel supported in your role? Um, and I would say it was a mixed bag from what I remember of qualitative interviews. Um, you know, there were some people that had great experiences and their supervisors were awesome. And then, you know, the uh, major conversations I've heard around the uh, conference today are often you're in the position of defending your role and saying why you are important to the company and stuff. And that shouldn't be your role as a peer, you know, peer provider. Um, so yeah, definitely a mixed bag when it came to supports. I think we'd also asked if they, um, in the interviews, if their state ho hosted any kind of like job fair as part of the certification process. Cause like, I mean, you know, you go get certified and then you're like, well, how do I find a job now? Um, and I think there was only one, maybe two states that did, that offered that. Yeah, I think someone else is saying that there have to be like employers. Like that's part of the problem too, right? There's, there's a lot of people getting certified and just not enough positions, even mm -hmm. though there's this great need. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's kind of our, one of our points, right, for supporting peer support workers in working in these mental health professional shortage areas is, let's be honest, rural communities can sometimes be a little bit more conservative and can often be a little bit more biased and unlikely to be open to the idea of what peer support is. And so that's why we made that point that, you know, the more evidence that we can get for peer support and, and show that uh, this work is really important, that spreads into those communities as well. And eventually we'll, hopefully, you know, you'll see peer supporters as a very common thing in every city and county and all that stuff. Yeah, I live in um, San Luis Obispo County and we do not have peer support here, like by design. And that's still the case. I don't know what they're doing with certification or participating or not, but um, it's really weird. It's like the people that didn't want to share names in a database. They're like, well, if we call someone a peer supporter, then they're going to be stigmatized. It's like, well, who's, where is that stigma coming from? Because it sounds like it's coming from you. So, or from the community. I mean, yeah, San Luis Obispo is a little bit behind. A lot of um, also, did you did you analyze what the you know break things down by type of lived experience and intersections intersectionality? What's the word? <laughs> intersectionality. Like yeah. When, okay. Like what what is there what? defining defining what the lived experience is and be like if there's more than one type one more category and with that place difference um as Leisha mentioned, oh go ahead. No, go ahead i was gonna say as, as Leisha mentioned earlier we didn't we did not assess people's lived experience we trusted the states in doing that in the certification process uh the only thing that we got to of identifying like different lived experiences were again i think we did ask specifically like do you have a mental health peer support or substance use or both um, and if they had mental health or both, because depending on the state, um, then they were included in, in our sample. Um, but again, the diagnosis was self-report and um, we just mostly use. Yeah, we asked diagnosis and we asked about their lifetime service use. So like, had they been in, inpatient, had they used outpatient mental health, outpatient substance use, medication or psychiatry? What about their um, other responsibilities? Like if they're a parent? Or, or they have an aging aging parent, they have other responsibilities outside the job? Yeah, we asked about um, other, like other unpaid um, productive activities, like volunteering, yeah. caregiving, school, starting a business, and things like that. And like, I'm curious, to, um, I think that's Deborah that was speaking. Um, yeah. Like if you have a, like something you'd like to know, we would totally be willing to look into that, like a specific question. Like how does live different kinds of lived experience like impact? Like what would you be interested in? Hold on a second. Um, yeah. Um, part of the thing is um, that I've been my theme for the day in almost every presentation has been 
um, sustainability in this kind of job. Um, my one of my primary diagnoses is ADHD, and um, aside from you know CPTSD, and um, accommodations is always the, I'm hearing like different things. Like I'm in another group. I'm in a group that um, helps entrepreneurs with ADHD. Um, <clears throat> And we had a whole presentation we should not disclose. You should not disclose when you're interviewing for a job. Now, obviously in this world, it's a little bit different, but it's kind of like a mixed bag about trying to get accommodations or support and then also finding one's niche, right? Because, you know, I have skills, I have tools, right? I can bring to the job because of the nature of my lived experience. So it's kind of hard to, kind of figure this out, but, and I think the issue of stigma and expectations by employers is sort of, um, or even with trainers, you know, I'm finding the training programs um, sort of categorize people. It's a subtle, it's a very, what you, not called microaggression, but there's a subtle kind of thing going on in that world too. So I, I don't know. I don't have a question. I'm just throwing out things yeah. that I've encountered already. And that's it. Great. Yeah, I was going to say, I think there's a lot more work to do on our like negative work experiences. And like Leisha had mentioned, the um, other productive but unpaid activities and how that contributed to these different things that we're talking about. Um, but I, I know we got into it in the interviews of, of you know, um, were you prepared by the, in the training to like work with different populations, like younger or, you know, aging populations and stuff like that. So there's a lot more to be done, definitely. But um, um, yeah, he, yeah, like DCFS here, the, the Department of Children and Family Services, they do actually have a, a, a pretty good job that's properly paid of a pair of, say, of a parent who's gone through the system to be um, like a mentor, which I think we'd look at. Um, I've spoken to somebody there, a guy who has a really good job, and he goes and he helps other parents. This is a um, kind of an area that's not really looked into too much because a lot of people, again, with the intersectionality is like, they may be stuck in a couple different systems. They may be in correctional, whatever you call it. They may have an addiction and then they have child protective services and um, they seem to be doing something really pretty interesting. That's all. Um, both Javier. for the peer and for the parents. Oh. Definitely. Javier. Awesome. Um, I just want uh, to say, I don't know if this is possible, um, but I think a really good question to be added or included, I don't know if it is, um, is if the individual has experienced any type of wellness center while in the education system. Um, here in California, a lot of our um, schools are now implementing wellness centers within uh, the high schools and junior highs, um, where a student can go um, and kind of like, I guess they have kind of like this like chair that has like music playing and then they have like a therapist on site and then they also have like um, a uh, kind of like fidget toys and stuff. Um, and so they're implementing those. Um, and then I also know that universities are starting to have their own wellness centers as well. Um, so I believe a lot of them are hiring peer supporters in a way, but they have different titles. Um, and I think that would be awesome to have like a data of, um, because that would show not only is peer support utilizing in an academic way, but also it is also a kind of bridge to mental health as well because schools are starting to recognize how important it is. Um, I know during finals, they had like puppy week where like they brought a bunch of puppies and stuff. And, you know, that's overall, that's mental health and, you know, the stress of finals, et cetera. Um, I don't know, just throwing out some ideas. Definitely, <laughs> yeah, thank you. As I think we had yeah. university as one of our options is like where you work as a peer support specialist. So we could definitely see if, if they were located there, although that might be research too, who knows. But we're gonna say Alicia. <laughs> yeah. um, Bethel has another question. Oh, well, I was curious. One of the things that came up in one of the camp role, um thing was if you were a peer support specialist and you come from a, a lived experience, regardless of what that looks like, and you actually hire clinicians, 
be able to look at that, like who was the the owner of the organization. Um, and in my um, experience, um, the wages have shifted depending on the certification as well. But at the end of the day, no matter how we look at it, it's still a business um, and they're still trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, and and I've, I've been doing this for a long time, but um, I got into the kind of what we're doing now before the certification was even um, available. So how they treated us before and how they treat us now is very different. Um, and I've seen the burnout aspect of it, but I've also seen the other side of it. So it's kind of interesting. I'm really glad you guys are doing this. I'm glad I chimed into this one. This was um, right up my alley. And I've worked with pro parolees and pre-release through the probation department. Um, and I'm so, as Mitchell was talking about that in, before that, but I think it poses an interesting, an interesting dynamic. So first of all, a lot of parolees don't, I think the, the laws in California have changed, but they don't have to actually disclose if they've been incarcerated, which gives them an opportunity to be a peer support. Um, I do know in having worked with um, pre-release and re-entry that that can make or break a person, even if they get into a non-related field of what we're talking about and they don't disclose, but they later disclose, like, even it's just like, hey, you know, you become familiar. I've seen it affect their job, you know, like the person treated them one way was great. You know, you go out have drinks, you try to build that camaraderie. And then that that background comes up and next thing you know, people, you know, lose their job for these reasons, right? So I think it's interesting that if you have a, if you're talking about peer supporters in different fields, uh, and I did a lot of work in construction logistics, but you can't disclose it, but you have to be a peer. Like, you no, know, how do you navigate that, right? There's some legalities and every state is different, but I think the idea of not disclosing would further, um, support uh, the video that um that mitchell had i know this is before your presentation but i think it very much coincides right because re-entry poses ptsd re-entry poses a whole bunch of other different issues and if you can relate to that and then the video that they showed about the 50 whatever he put in the link to me shows how they're reducing recidivism and again i worked in the state of california when i worked for the pro department recidivism was 26 percent the national average was only 13 percent when you get people who have had that experience and say, hey, you know what? I know you're in a gang. I know you do that. But guess when you get to jail, the same person you were shooting at, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be sold with them. You know, there's so, so many different things that we can talk about. So I'm just curious. Um, again, I don't want to um, filibuster the whole thing, but just curious as to how you can actually transition that. Because in the pre-release program, again, when they started doing rehabilitation, we brought resources that would actually include peer support. I mean, you know, but a lot of it was like, you know, housing, things like that, jobs, right? Education. I taught college. So I was in the education program through workforce development. And we were able to transition. Well, when we transitioned them successfully, they didn't go back. So if they can transition into pure roles, right, as mentors, because we still have a huge gang issue and these other things, then how much more successful would they be? Right. And so um, maybe looking at expungement and certificate of rehabilitation for parolees as a form of disclosing but not right because once you have the expungement disclosement unless you're working for particular jobs um or organizations like county organizations you you know you don't have to disclose some places you have to disclose no matter what um but i think that those things would be important to um to identify with and then as a private organization what's the liability because i do believe in reentry and i've seen rehabilitation work tremendously when you just educate and employ people um what what is a liability for the entrepreneur who believes in that and supports reentry in that way, right? Because if you don't have these other pieces, what does it look like? So I mean, I can't hire someone who has that to speak to those different demographics. And there's a lot of money in the reentry and peer workspace space. So I mean, how do you have so much money to hire that, but then you don't actually allow them to be employed? Because there's tons of grants in reentry. Yeah, like, I wonder how much like, um, you know, there's like the, the legal policy issues contribute to this, like the stigma that you were talking about, you know, where you it's not, you know, a problem at your job that you were had been incarcerated, but you tell someone over drinks and then, you know, then your job, the nature of your job changes. But how much of that actually is just funneling down from the legal issues, you know, or being able to not hire people because they were incarcerated or not being able to hire people because they had been incarcerated. Um, right. That it's sort Absolutely. of the attitudes are coming from that. 
that long. Absolutely. And I want to add one more thing and then I'll shut up. But, you know, one of the things that, that we saw was like, like, for instance, like construction, right? So in construction, a guy who or gal who had been incarcerated, which I've seen both of these happen because I, I ran a program, um, as long as they didn't work on a school, right? So like, let's say you have some mm -hmm. different, you know, because your incarceration has to be dependent on these other things. So we have three different things at play. So like, if you had any kind of sexual offense, whatever, you could be employed, but you couldn't work on any school. So if you got, if the person, and I've seen where the contractor got a school at a job, at a, at a job at a school, the person couldn't work on that because of their background, right? Because they do additional background checks. So I've seen that. Then you have the whole thing where in the state of California, um, a lot of it has to do with drug related charges. Well, they're starting to repeal some of those things because they've just legalized marijuana, right? So now there's these different dynamics going on to repeal some of those um, indictments based on the fact that you legalized it and some of the other disparities that were going on. Now, again, I'd just be curious as to how to create a pathway, a real pathway, you know, um, into that field based on uh, some legalities that are just there, some of the advocacies that are actually occurring in this, in this field. And then again, the oxymoron between putting so much money in reentry, but not actually creating an opportunity for those in reentry to actually be employed by the funding that's allotted for it. So I know that's a lot, but um, thank you yeah. for allowing thank me. Thank you. To yeah, there's a lot to think about. Can I jump in a little bit um, with what you were presenting? Um, this would, would uh, some of my experience with my background, I have had felony trafficking, um, trafficking and sales and possession of sales of drugs on my record, several uh, prison stays, um, uh, drug and alcohol addictions, uh, things like that, mental health, all of that. But one of the things that I learned as I worked in the field and I happened at this at that time to be working at a just straight mental health uh, place. I actually walked a client through um, Prop 47, going to the courthouse and being able to pull your record and 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 um, uh, set you know pull all of your past. Um, God. Um, all your past, uh, uh, your record, right? And have it presented in front of the court. I, I never had to, to even go into the court myself physically. I didn't have to hire a lawyer. All I had to do was take all my paperwork to the district attorney's office. They walked everything through, but I had some years behind me of, you know, not going to jail, you know, my life being, that, but being better, but they didn't ask about my life being better. You know, they um, just wanted to present it what my charges were. And what I was looking at, I was looking at having my charges drop down to misdemeanors and not and not felonies. So when I walked a client through it, I went back and I walked myself through it. And I actually got all of my felonies um, broke down to misdemeanors. And now I'm told that I can go through and try to have them expunged. Now, I don't know how it works with other charges like sexual charges and things like that, but I think that the people that we are um, giving the information to, you know, like my passion is to go back into the prison, to the AA, NA meetings, wherever, to the parole, probation, and tell them what's available to us now who have had, you know, a, a shady past and, you know, and what, um, how, what we're bringing to the table, you know, now of people with lived experience whose lives have changed, can be changed. And we're able to help other people, give another person a hand up, you know. Um, so I think if we spread this information and let them know that we can be productive now, we can be productive citizens, you know, we can make a difference, you know. And now it's a certified, a position that's certified, you know. So it would it just beginning in the state of California, like where I work, only three of us out of 10 are certified right now, but it's a beginning. And that for me, it, it gives me an excitement of knowing, you know, that there's room to grow and that I, I'm excited to be able to share with people that are still struggling or even on their way out, you know, to the free world and out, you know, um, to try to become a productive person, to share that information and, and even do a little hand, uh, hand holding, you know, to lead a person to what they need to you know get to that level of where where we are and to be able to be productive so i just wanted to share that because there is you know that was one of the ways that i was able to 
address, you know, some of the things in, in my past. And I'm sure to work for other people, you know. Um, I don't know how, you like I said, I don't know as, as far as whatever their charges may be, but there is some help, you know, for expungement and having um, cases lowered down to misdemeanors. And then especially with, you know, us being certified peers, now people with lived experience, I think we'll have more um, more access to, to be able to pre become productive citizens. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for sharing that, Joy. Um, I do want to make sure Joy has their hand up, and I just want to make sure that if it's a question about our presentation, because I know that the, the other one will be starting soon. So it's a it's a quick question, actually. Thank you so much for all the information, everyone. Um, my question is in, in addressing the quasi no win situation of disclosure of one's disability, et cetera. Um, when, when looking for job postings, is there a filter that you would recommend to assess through the job posting text, you know, that um, a work environment is more disability friendly than not? Like I'm thinking about maybe if, uh, the job posting talked about that that they were trauma informed space uh, trauma informed space. That might be a little hint that's inviting for people of a, like people like us who have disabilities that we're not sure how much or whether to disclose. Yeah, I mean, so like I said, Live and Learn is a peer run organization. So in our job posting, we always put we can, you know we can't put it as a requirement, but we have like a statement about like you know, experience with a disability or mental health services is an asset. And, you know, we have a similar statement about um, race and ethnicity and cultural experiences. So I think you kind of, because of like laws around disabilities and race and, th and gender and things like that, you kind of have to go into the fine print. I would love for there to be some kind of filter like that. It would make my job as someone who hires people yes. a lot easier. Um, since we can't ask in interviews. So we sort of have this like nebulous question of like, how do you see lived experience informing research? But I think it's hard on the applicants and on people who are looking to hire people with disabilities too. So, well, I, um, I think for myself, it's really difficult because it takes time and energy to read postings and then to tailor your resume according to yeah. what the job description uh, states, because, you know, there's a whole art to matching your resume to whatever they have on the job posting um good bad or indifferent but um so i'm i'm just trying to figure out a way that i can reduce and uh, be more efficient with my time and be a little more strategic in what i'm looking for in the job posting so i'm i'm heartened that live and learn has those you know specifications that are assuring for those of us in the in the in the field that we're in um but i'm just wondering if in your experience and your research, if you've done done this, I, you're, you're already covering a lot of ground. Um, if if there is a, a more scientific way to for a person like me and other job seekers to kind of filter out which spaces are safe and, and like basically a lot of work environments are toxic. We all know that, and I'm just trying to figure out how to mine for the gold of the people and places that are safe for, for us. <clears throat> I can't think of anything that you could search for in the job search part itself, but if you were to have an interview, I think a great question as we've been asked it before um, when we do interviews is um, what's your work culture like? Um, and that kind of opens the conversation up to learn a little bit. I mean, they can say whatever they want, right? To make it sound like they're, they have a great work culture. Uh, but, but seeing how off guard they are when you ask that, um, or, you know, how they respond to it. But the other thing is too, is if, if the job posting includes anything about their work culture, cause like, I think in our postings, we're like, you know, very flexible like hours. Balance, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah we promote work like balance. So using those yeah. keywords in your search of like flexibility and work-life balance, not, I'm sure many companies don't use those words, but if they do, then I think that they're probably a little bit more likely to have a more welcoming culture. Thank you. That's great feedback. Yeah. And I, I know someone's saying like peer, peer run respites, peer run organizations. So if there's any word of that peer, definitely that's, that's a, 
good indicator as well. I mean, I probably go to their website and make sure they're talking about the right, the right kind of fear. <laughs> but I think yeah. still like I see more and more like just talking about lived experience, like in general, right? So including like experiences of racism and sexism and all of that. So that's maybe a term you can search for because, you know, I would hope that organizations that are looking to have a de- more more diverse workforce, like will include disabilities in that and including disabilities, hopefully mental health conditions, but you know, no guarantees. I think you have to get to the interview. I have to go. Sorry, guys. Thank um, you. Have another both. appointment. Thank you, everybody. And yeah, be in touch if you have ideas or need things. Yes, definitely. And if you need the PowerPoint slides before share sh- sends them, let me know. You have my email, hopefully. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Dynamite presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.